I'm Johan Joubert, here with the Optimization Group, Center for Transport Development in the Industrial and Systems Engineering. And I want to use this video to tell you a little bit about our modeling philosophy, why we work the way we do and build the type of models that we are known for. I believe as engineers, our goal is to solve problems. And whenever I talk about a problem, I also refer in the same kind of terms to an opportunity for improvement. Now, these problems exist in a domain that I call reality. It's out there. It's all around us. But it's messy. It's got multiple objectives, people trying to do different things and achieve, chase different objectives. Um, as an example, if you grew up in a family, only one child, and you grew up in a neighborhood, for example, Watertloof, chances are that you will look at this problem um, and you will view it very differently than somebody with the same degree but who grew up in a family of six siblings who were looked after by their grandparents in some rural village because the mom and dad both had to move to the city to earn minimum wage incomes. Right? So we look at problems differently given our backgrounds. Now imagine you sit around the table with people from different disciplines, different cultures, different ethnic groups, different genders. There might be somebody from legal who's always interested in the fi fine print. There's a chartered accountant, the chief financial officer. There's somebody from the union. And there's one other engineer, a mechanical engineer, who heads up uh, design and maintenance. If you want to look at this company's problem, this opportunity that you want to, to exploit, you will definitely look at the problem very differently. So what version of this problem will you jointly decide to actually solve? And that is quite important because your view is very small. You only see one very small portion, and I, I refer to that here as the, as the assumed reality. And it goes without saying that you always want to challenge your assumed reality. You always want to, to extend it, to take other people's views and um, take their views into, into account and understand where they're actually coming from. But you will remain biased. And it's important to appreciate that. But at some point we need to slice and dice this problem smaller and smaller until we get to agree on exactly what version of the problem we're going to solve. And I refer to that thing, that artifact, that decision that we actually agree on as the model. So have some appreciation that when we talk about moving from a problem to a model, that it's quite a journey in terms of getting different people's inputs, understand where they're coming from, what their objectives are, why they want to do it the way that they want to do it, until we get to this agreed upon version that we call the model, which is now what we will take um, forth for the rest of the problem life cycle. And once you have a model, you can go further and solve it. But take note that you solve the model. You don't solve the problem. You solve this abstraction of reality, so you have to make sure that this model is worth solving in the first place, that it is a good enough representation of reality. And once you have the solution, you need to translate it back or infer or interpret those results generated often by software into decisions that real people can understand and real people will actually make. Because it's those decisions that get implemented and ultimately solve the original problem. Now the challenge is that traditionally and probably still in many cases, the main focus in education, and you're at the university as well, is on focusing on this leg of solving. You are given a model and you're asked to actually solve it. For example, in mathematics, you are given an integral and asked to solve it. You've got your rules, you apply your rules, and you go through the motions very systematically to find a solution. Same with derivatives. Same with some statistical models. But we don't know where those models actually come from or what they represent in reality. And that can be problematic. So, so why do we focus on this particular leg? I think it's well articulated by two really great minds, Colin Wallace, um, who said in the preface of their book on stochastic programming, 
All instructors know that modeling is harder to teach than our methods. We are sorry to admit that this difficulty persists in this text as well. That is, we do not provide an in-depth discussion of modeling. Hmm. And that is why we chose a very different path in our group. And that is on firstly focusing on modeling, on this process of moving from a problem into a model, coming up with an abstraction that is really worth solving, that is a good enough representation of the original problem, and not just having one type of tool in, in our toolbox, whether it's agent-based modeling or complex networks or simulation or mathematical programming or stochastic programming or whatever our tool is that we, that we use, we always try and ensure that the model is a good representation of reality and that it is worth solving in the first place. But in the same breath, it is equally important that we actually focus on the interpretation, on inferring the solutions again. Because at some point we need to be honest and walk away from some of our models because they simply cannot answer the questions that we actually set out to, to answer. Sometimes the answer is, no, you can't. So you need to know your model well enough to know what it can and cannot do in terms of solving your original problem. A couple of years ago, in 2010, Mike Pidd, wrote a really great article. And he said that it's very important that you understand modeling and model use and why it actually matters. So he came up with, with this model in terms of the continuum. Uh, and on the far right-hand side, you have um, decision automation. Those are decisions that are made completely autonomously. And then on this right-hand extreme, you provide insight for debate. So you build models. It's mainly human uh, interaction or human intervention. Um, but it's not automated. It's something that's kind of a once-off one discussion. Uh, it might be something like um, discussing what the impact of uh, minibus taxi subsidies would be on, on transport and affordability. Now, when we look at decision automation, that might be something like logging onto Google Maps and say, I want to travel from A to B and give me the route using my car. And lo and behold, it automatically, without anybody behind the scenes intervening, it will provide you with a route to travel between those two points. As a matter of fact, it will provide you probably with a couple of alternatives, but nobody intervened. It's fully automated, but it's only a model. Uh, you can then still look as the decision maker, look at those and decide, hmm, I like this option best because... I know some of the other routes, there's some risk of hijacking, or there's a steep hill, or there's additional toll that I didn't take into, into account. What is important is that you understand where along this continuum your model actually fits, because you need to build the model with that in mind. If you want to solve a company's logistics problem, and you want to focus on the portion where they make routine decisions, for example, deciding every night which customers orders to place on which vehicles and what the visiting order should be for, for each one of those trucks. Now that is referred to as the vehicle routing problem. And it is there to solve routine decision making uh, challenges, maybe on a daily basis. But it's a very different formulation to the problem than solving another variant of the same problem which is called the heterogeneous fleet size and mix problem, which you only solve, solve maybe once in every six months because there the goal is to decide what should my fleet composition be? How many large trucks, how many light delivery vehicles should I have? How do I actually go about building up my fleet over time? So it's not something that you make on a daily basis. And in our group, we typically focus on system investigation and improvement. So we're kind of here on the upper extremes, um, the upper echelons of, the, of this model. Because we don't, usually don't get involved in, in routine uh, decision making. Definitely not in decision automation. We build models, we investigate the system, we fine tune the models, and then in the end, we actually part with our own models and hand them over to the clients. So as models mature, they actually move from investigation models all the way to decision automa uh, automation models. So sometimes you need to start with just getting the insight 
and then moving along um, as the models actually mature. Now, <clears throat> this process of model building, once you've decided where to actually pitch them, um, is an iterative process. You need to understand, you actually need to be a translator between two worlds. You need to understand the world, the real world out there, and their vernacular, and their language, and their terminology, but you also need to understand the modeling world. So you need to know your models very well. They don't give a dictionary to somebody that is great in one language, but horrible in the second. They give a dictionary to somebody who knows both languages very well and know how to translate between these two worlds. And that is what we do as well. So we navigate between the real world and then we encode them into a model and then take the model, solve it, and decode the answers back again and evaluate the model and the decisions that we actually want to, want to actually take. Now on the encoding side, there's a lot of data preparation. Data gathering, remote sensing, working with very big data sets, and doing the data analysis and the data cleaning and all in a reproducible manner. And on the other side, when we talk about the, the evaluation, there's a lot of data science that happens there as well. Inferring the patterns, understanding the structure that actually emerges or the behavior that actually emerges out of these models. Now here, what is very important to actually note is that the real world need to be approached with a specific scenario in mind or a specific metric. And sometimes these metrics are competing and multiple. Somebody wants to minimize risk while somebody else wants to maximize profit. And the union wants to minimize the number of people that gets laid off. Or you need to look at specific scenarios. I have a production line for which I want to build a model, but I want to evaluate. Do I take out this piece of machinery and replace it with, with a highly automated piece of equipment? Or do I want to add more labor um, and workers in a particular area? Or do I want to redesign and change the layout of, of, of the flow? I need to know what the scenarios are that I want to ultimately model and evaluate before I actually start building the model. Because it will influence the way in which you go about building your model. And then it's equally important to actually approach your model knowing that it has a specific specification. There are certain things that you can and cannot do with certain types of models. If you build a linear program or an integer linear program, you are not accounting for the uncertainty that is inherent in the decision-making process. So it's limited. You can only work with the deterministic values. You can predict them, but even if you predict them using a very sophisticated model, you still take the predicted value and bring it into the model as a deterministic value. So the model has got limits in terms of what it can and cannot do. You need to change and challenge the model. You need to either employ stochastic programming, chance constraint, or recourse, or you need to look at something else, such as simulation, for example. So every model comes with certain specifications, and as the model aid is your responsibility, and have been our responsibility over the last couple of years, to make sure that we understand this modeling world well enough that we know what certain models can and cannot do. And then iteratively, go through the motions of building a model and refining it until we understand it well enough and can actually ultimately hand it over to customers who can then deploy them into more routine decision-making systems.